Hey everybody, welcome back to It's Too Late to Apologize Book Reviews. I'm Stella, and today we are going to be talking about The Secret History by Donna Tartt. So The Secret History was Donna Tartt's debut novel, published in 1992. And what a debut novel it was. Donna Tartt is practically the queen mother of the dark academia aesthetic, but we'll talk more about that later. This is another contemporary novel, so I'll avoid spoilers so I don't ruin this enjoyment of reading this book for anybody who hasn't yet. The novel tells the story of a closely knit group of six classic students at Hampton College, a small elite liberal arts college located in Vermont, New England. It's basically an inverted detective story narrated by one of the six students, Richard Papin, who reflects years later upon the situations that led to the murder of their friend, Edmund Bunny. Cochrane, where the events leading up to the murder are slowly revealed to the reader. The novel explores the circumstances and lasting effects of Bunny's death on the socially isolated group of students. But it's not only about Bunny's murder. This book is about the exploration of philosophy and beauty and classic literature and language. Right in the beginning, you're hooked into the story by learning on page one that Bunny was killed. I mean, you have no idea who Bunny is yet, but the narrator is telling you that he and his friends planned out this murder of their friend. They planned out their friend's murder. And it's at that point on page one that Tart grabbed me by the nose hairs and pulled me into the story. And it's this exposition that throws this feeling of suspense and dread over the rest of the story. As the novel goes on, you get to know these characters so well, as Tart does an amazing job of characterization and description that they feel so real. So many times it felt as if most of the characters actually breathe. Even many of the side characters outside of the main characters click and inner circle feel three-dimensional. Like we all know a Judy Pooby, don't we? Don't we? So you slowly get to know these characters and you wonder, how could they kill Bunny? You like Bunny. He's the most open and friendly of the group of these reclusive students, especially to Richard, who's an outsider. But then ever so slowly, you see the change you discover that things aren't what they first seemed. And boy, is that a reoccurring theme in this novel. You slowly begin to see Bunny's flaws, his selfishness, his snobbery, and his complete lack of empathy for anybody but himself. And worst of all, you see Bunny's impending betrayal of the group of friends. And it's at that point you realize, my God, this guy's gotta die. And as soon as you think that, which you will, Donna's got you, you are an accessory to this murder, just like Richard is you are complicit. And all the other characters, Henry, Francis, Charles, and Camilla, at first seem cold and aloof to Richard. And then that changes too. They seem so closely knit to one another, only for you to realize that you never really knew the whole story, and you never might. And that's so real. You might also realize how you were taken into the warped perspectives of these rich, privileged people who have convinced themselves that this murder is justified and in everyone's benefit. But let's go back to Richard, our protagonist. He's from the soulless concrete blase world of Plano, California, where the popular way to pass time is to go to the mall. Richard is a lonely soul. He's an only child. His relationship with his parents is less than lukewarm. He goes into pre-med, but abandons it for literature. And he meets the rest of this group at Hampton and constantly feels like an outsider. He's of middle-class origins, and the others are very rich, and so he feels the need to hide this part of himself to fit in or excel at the prestigious Hampton College. And his favorite novel is The Great Gatsby. And wow, is that not the perfect novel for Richard to be entranced by? Well done, Tart. Well frickin' done. Gatsby, a man of humble beginnings who falls in love with a woman out of his social class and so he lies about his past and tries to fit in with the vapid, morally bereft, bored socialites who think they're better than everyone else because of their money. And come to think of it now, there's a lot of similarities between Richard and Nick. Both don't really have an opinion about the actions of these people around them. And I think that's done on purpose, to have the reader's perspective unpolluted by the narrator. It's important that Richard doesn't schmooze you with his opinion, or that you don't even really know Richard's opinion, or that he is quite neutral, so that you yourself can feel how it is to be swayed by these intelligent, but cold and enigmatic, but in the end, self-centered people. But really, I feel like one could do a horoscope or like a tarot card reading based on only asking a person what their favorite novel is, right? I mean, right? It just says so much about a person, doesn't it? I might need to do a video about that. But anyways, this novel, 
tells you a murder has happened, and tells you who did it. So some might think there won't be any surprises or suspense to be had, but oh no, there is. This isn't a murder mystery. It's a motive mystery. Not just in why did they kill Bunny, but why does anyone do the things they do? It's the five other students that Richard befriends that are the mystery. It's a slow burn of a story, as most character-driven plots are, but it's intriguing or at least it was to me. Just when you think that the story should be done and we understand how and why they've killed Bunny, which happens pretty much smack dab in the middle of the book, it's not over. That's not the end of the story. It doesn't end at the climax, as in reality, no one's story does. There's so much more to it than that. And this portion after Bunny dies and we see what happens in the book feels like an ode to Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. There's really this masterfully done moment where Bunny and his murder, up to that point, really felt like an abstraction. But while the group stays with Bunny's family for the funeral, Bunny becomes more of a real person than he was when he was actually alive. We see the humanity in Bunny more so than when he was alive, by seeing the people who loved him mourn him. So there we see Bunny's humanity. And so we see the other characters finally realize the weight of their actions, and they first experience the depths of remorse. There were several moments during the funeral where I felt Dostoevsky's presence in the prose, and then literally, the next paragraph was a quote from that novel. And it's so fitting, as Crime and Punishment was all about a guy who thought himself superior to his fellow man, to the point that he felt above the laws put forth by lesser men, and because he was better than that man who made the law, he shouldn't need to follow them. And that's Henry. But the only difference is that Henry, in his anachronistic views, leaned fully into this idea, whereas Raskolnikov, in Crime and Punishment, didn't, and suffered for the rest of his life for his hubris. But while Henry didn't suffer much from the emotional ramifications of his actions, he experiences them secondhand. But Donna Tartt is also a huge Dickens fan, and I could really see the Dickens influence in her writing. The way she describes scenes and people remind me of Dickens, and the story being told in the first person and a reflection of past events really reminded me of great expectations in a way. But I gotta tell you, any book nerd is going to appreciate how into literature this story and its characters are. For some strange reason, I thought I'd just mark out all the literary references that I come across in this novel. And look at this. I don't, I don't know if you can see that. Most of these, I, I would say probably 90% of these, have way more than just one uh, noted reference on each of these sticky notes. This book is atmospheric academia at its best, which is why it's become a sort of cult classic for the whole dark academia aesthetic, which is kind of poetic considering Richard is chasing this aesthetic as well. This book makes you want to curl up in a leather armchair in a library by a fire while it's raining outside with a moulion window sitting slightly ajar to let the sound of the rain trickle in while you drink a cup of coffee or tea and read your book by the crackling fire. This book really delves into the idea of aesthetics. We talk a little bit about aesthetics, but like, what does it actually mean? Aesthetics is a set of principles concerned with the nature of appreciation of beauty, especially in art. And it's a branch of philosophy that deals with the principles of beauty and artistic taste. And it just so happens to be a Greek word. I mean, how fitting is that? And I find it interesting that a book so into classic aesthetics has become a classic for the dark academia aesthetic. And if you don't know what dark academia is, I mean, you can look it up online. There's lots of uh, Pinterest boards that'll show you what this uh, look is all about. It's all about um, leaning into old classic looks and sort of boarding school chic and the, the preppy look of school uniforms um, and, and plaid and coats and, and all that kind of stuff I love and definitely embody it a little bit more in the wintertime when it's really cold here in Canada. It's an easy aesthetic to fall into and I quite like the classic look of it. But when we're talking about aesthetics, there is a scale to this. And at one end is stark, dull utility, and at the other is tasteless, theatrical aesthetic. And to stand somewhere on that scale is to not stand elsewhere on that scale. There is no such thing as reaping only the benefits of a stance. There are pros and cons no matter where you stand on that scale. And this is about more than just the physical fashion or architecture. At its core, it's the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, and not for the sake of writing an essay or passing an exam. It doesn't even need to happen at a university. And that is kind of what I like about dark academia as an aesthetic or in general. Oftentimes, I feel people think it's as if education 
gives one perspective and wisdom in life. But I find the most interesting conversations I have are with a random bricklayer or carpenter or a random person in an aisle at a bookstore. I've conversed with homeless people and find those conversations extremely intriguing as well. Profession is no measure of intellect or ability or depth for that matter. Intellectual pursuits into history, philosophy, literature is much more about enriching both the mind and the soul. It's not even about utility, even though it has it, in a sense, but in a manner that's difficult to quantify. It's about improving the personal landscape of one's inner world. I view education today as a utility to find a job. It's so expensive that I find it to be the best use. It is formal education, but one must remember that there are many types of informal education and that all professors at universities are not created equal. It is actually a dream of mine to attend university for literature and philosophy but it isn't the location or aesthetic of the university that would draw me to such an endeavor. It's a professor's mind that would. Much like everyone is attracted to Julian in this novel, and how he appealed to Richard as well. To attend university for pleasure would be the definition of the ultimate luxury for me. One that I slowly chip away at through personal informal education for myself, through reading books. There is often more enlightenment in books than there is in real life. Books are these time machines that allow us to converse with some of the greatest minds of all time. Minds that have shaped the world we inhabit today. But as with all things, there are pros and cons, and The Secret History does a marvelous job of illustrating this. Knowledge is associated with light, but all light also casts shadows. Enlightenment can come at the cost of abstraction, of dehumanization. Aesthetics alone are hollow and lack nuance. Knowledge is a gift, and a desperately beautiful one at that. Imagine a place of bookish devotion and exploration that surpasses the capitalist university's modern-day capacities to focus on pleasure, interest, and challenging one's intellectual endurance. So have you read The Secret History? I really enjoyed this book, but I can see how it's not going to be for everyone. It's a slow burn, as I said. And even though I enjoy those things, there were even moments where I thought, it could have been a little more succinct. But have you read this novel? Let me know in the comments down below. Please like and subscribe so that more people can discover some great books. And I'll see you in the next video.